So good afternoon uh, or good evening to everybody in Europe. Good night for those who are east, uh, east to us. And good uh, morning, I think, to Wish, who's in, 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 in Chicago. Um, we have the first keynote lecture of ECTPG 2021. Uh, before that, we have three uh, parallel sessions which went very, very well with, with a good attendance level and uh, very good intensity and test discussions um, and fruitful uh, interactions already. So we are on, on, on cruise, uh, cruise speed now. And nothing more, nothing better to close the first afternoon with a, with a great talk uh, by Professor Luis Butencourt, who is the inaugural director of the Mansfield Institute for Urban Innovation at the University of Chicago, and also professor of ecology and evolution at the college. Uh, Luis is also a prof an external professor, I think, yes, it's the name, at Santa Fe Institute. And it's a pleasure for me, well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there because most probably everyone knows already Luis's work, etc. It's a pleasure for me because we as myself are the Portuguese and it's always a pleasure to introduce Portuguese academics in this context. Luis, muito obrigado pela tua disponibilidade. The floor is yours. Obrigado, Nuno. Uh, my pleasure is mine. Uh, I hope uh, you can hear me. If not, please interrupt me. I may not notice. Uh, so it's a great pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's sort of about lunchtime here, about 12 noon. And so uh, we usually have lunch of our uh, institute here, but uh, I'm missing it for a good cause, which is to be with you. So, and as Nuno also said, I'd love to, you know, maybe in years to come, we can do this together in person. Um, otherwise, a talk is always flying a little bit blind, not seeing your reactions, but I hope you'll be useful. So I, I set myself up for um, um, a little bit of a, uh, an overview of, of a number of themes. And I want to tell you mostly about how I came to geography and uh, specifically through the lens of cities and how in some sense uh, I, I see both the state of what we know about cities and what we can do with new evidence and new questions, but also how uh, uh, we can maybe read and, and, and think about the state of geography uh, in your community uh, through this lens. So let me just share the screen and bring my slides up. Give me a moment and then all this will start making more sense, hopefully. So I hope you can see it. Um, and, um, and so I'm gonna start moving the slides then. So uh, I'm also, one thing I didn't share with you is that we have a committee of geographical sciences here. Uh, it was shared by Luke Anselin, you probably know about him, and is now uh, in a new version shared by Neil Brenner. And so we've, we've kept sort of the flame of geographical sciences alive here at the University of Chicago, where it's gone through a number of, of, of flows and in some senses being is changing identity. And I'll tell you a little bit about that as well as, as part of the theme that we'll explore together. So what I want to say today is a little bit about progress in geography, at least some progress, I'm not saying it's the whole progress at all, but through the lens of cities and what we've discovered about cities uh, sort of in, the last, in the last few decades. Uh, but accelerating, I think, to the present time. And, and what may, may be, cities are sort of uh, places of integration. Obviously, they build spaces, they integrate people, they, brought, they bring them into interactions. And I think they provide a number of unifying themes across scales, across uh, people and the physical environment. So how is it that we can see a bit more of geography uh, in terms of uh, human and physical geography and aspects of it in more integrated ways? So let's see if we can make these move. Uh-oh. Okay, wait a second. Um, okay, sorry, I was having trouble with this. Let me just see. Okay. Um, let me try that again. Okay, so it's working. So uh, in the way of introduction, I came to the University of Chicago about four years ago from the Santa Fe Institute where uh, as you may know, is a place for interdisciplinary research, particularly in complex systems, which is a thing that runs through this. I, I'm glad to see Mike Batt is in the audience. He's been one of the pioneers of, of this perspective into cities and geography. But uh, it's also a place that in some sense is small. So coming back to the University of Chicago, a place that has had a long tradition in uh, urbanism, but also cities, uh, there was an opportunity to create a new institute. So uh, this is happening a lot. It's happening even a little bit in Manchester, I think, in its own way. But uh, we're really having uh, institutes dedicated and other efforts dedicated to this idea of interdisciplinary synthesis, 
And so a new opportunity to study particularly cities in terms of the processes that drive, shape and sustain them, but with an eye also towards the future of creating more sustainable, more fair cities. So in some sense, that's my job now. And uh, in that sense, uh, a lot of the work that uh, I'm going to tell you about is the work of many people and that starts touching uh, larger themes. But I, I want to speak about it relatively generally. And this is sort of where you can find me. There's a website there for the Institute. And this is a new book that just came out this August where I try to uh, summarize what I think is sort of an integrated way to look at cities. This builds a lot on books that Mike Batty and others have written, for example, in the introduction, themes like networks as uh, tools to study cities, but also as uh, uh, I, I take it, I think a little further in the sense of providing evidence for the specific kinds of networks that cities build and how they give us not a set of tools, but also a set of principles to understand their fundamental properties. More on that in a moment. So to just situate us, I want to situate us both a little bit in terms of what I think we are in terms of studying cities and also where we think we are uh, in relation to some uh, classical themes in geography. So this slide is sort of a sketch of, of some of this and it relates to, in some sense, to twin, uh, you can call them revolutions, uh, that are affecting the way we work, but also creating new questions and new methods. One is in some sense what I'm calling here universal urbanization. The fact that certainly before COVID, um, we were seeing almost every country in the world becoming more urban. Uh, urban is different from what it used to be, it includes a lot of suburbs and some sprawl, but nevertheless creates these functional large cities that are connected by mobility flows and you now uh, technology flows that uh, 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 are making us live in ways that are more connected and have more consequences that speed up a lot of socioeconomic life. But the one that goes with it already mentioned is this digital revolution that we're having a, a new wave of technologies. Technologies are always very uh, important for cities. Cities are always great adopters of technologies. Uh, you see that through, through history. But we have now technologies, particularly communications and information technologies that are closer to the spirit of cities. And in many ways, they both reinforce and compete with the way cities work. So the result of these two things, which are two self-reinforcing general trends, is that we have a lot of data and computing that allowing us methodologically to study cities and social and physical situations with much greater detail. And we also have a lot of comparative analysis. So we can look at cities that are very different. Cities, as I'll tell you a little bit, through history, for which we have sort of recovered our new data through, through the forms of... Uh, surveying, but also above all cities throughout the world, uh, many sizes, many different cultural contexts, many levels of development. And this allows us to test ideas that may generalize to what is common to cities, but also what's different. So out of this, I think there's a field emerging that uh, 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 might call the science of cities, identical urban science, but it's essentially the same thing. Uh, so a scientific approach to studying cities of all kinds uh, uh, and also a lot of tools often called by uh, some colleagues, for example, NYU and other places called urban analytics, which have become to a large extent spatialized tools that are often uh, rich in data, but sometimes also in, in, in qualitative evidence for um, better understanding societies and cities in particular. So this is kind of changing the way we work, but also asking new questions and giving us sort of uh, a new set of, uh, of uh, maybe general uh, ideas about how uh, all these environments may work. But this is also extending. So if, if we start having anything that we consider a science, the idea is that th this knowledge becomes generalizable. And so we should be able to push it back in history. And a lot of my work is about this too. And of course, uh, the most important exercise is to have knowledge that generalizes, that can apply to future situations that are completely different from what we have. So in doing this, data is not enough, right? That in some sense is an historical evidence of what has happened. It doesn't tell us what should happen in the future if we hope cities to be different, fairer, more just, more sustainable. So we need to find a way to capture what we think is going on in these environments in a way that would generalize to new situations. What about geography, right? So from the point of view, uh, many of you will know from, of the US, and I think my, even though I'm European and I did my PhD in Britain, I spent the rest of my time here. Uh, I think geography has been a very unsettled field in sort of the last generation. A generation ago, we had these conceptual wars between people that were quantitative and qualitative, uh, sort of the quantitative revolution, the cultural turn, uh, the emphasis on um, you know physical versus cultural and human. And I think we've learned a lot. We all came out a little bruised, but what I'm advocating with this talk as well 
is that we think of what we should be doing now with all this evidence and, and context and attention to humans, but also attention to, um, to what we can derive that may be uh, generalized between contexts. So uh, I think this in the 21st century now is not a controversial statement, but I think when you think about space and geography, we always talk about spaces that are constructed. I don't mean this in a strictly structural way. I mean stuff that we actually are building and that it keeps changing. And they're, they're constructed collectively by diverse agents, heterogeneous agents, if you want to use that expression, in interaction. So in some sense, this is what cities are. Cities have specific properties uh, in terms of what this means. But nevertheless, this is always true. And we live in a world sort of in the Anthropocene where almost every environment is touched by humans one way or another, in many ways, in, in some ways that we need to uh, improve and, and fix. But, but it's hard to think that uh, we cannot th look at space in this sort of dynamical and interactive way. And in some sense, when humans interact, you know, there are uh, processes of competition, which I often emphasize. So a lot of social theory that came into geography, particularly through both sort of uh, economics of uh, individual agents uh, and rational behavior, and, and then through Marxist theory that uh, emphasizes, you know, collective dynamics and sort of uh, group sometimes conflict and resolution really emphasizes competition. Uh, of one way or another. But in some sense, what's special about almost all these spaces is that they're cooperative built. So this cooperation is often underemphasized. And I'll talk to about it a little bit through my talk, because in some sense, there's no city if there's no some sort of cooperation. This is often mediated by institutions and politics. Politics, of course, means the stuff of cities. It doesn't mean what we think it means in our sort of current parlance. And so in some sense, this process is the process that needs to be studied. And I think is the process in some sense that unifies physical and human geography, but also allows us to uh, get away from sort of a purely structural, purely individualistic perspective. So I already said this, that in some sense, if you just look at spaces physically, you find a lot of contingencies on technology, on wealth, on politics, on social preferences. If you look at social spaces, you find a lot of also other contingencies because physical space, time, effort, all uh, dominate uh, how social spaces can and cannot be constructed. And so in some sense, you need to bring this together. And that's the novelty, it's sort of the synthesis of ability because we have data and methods, but because also I think we need these ideas as a take on what we've learned from sort of the previous generation. And the idea is to push this into the future and to new situations like sustainable cities. So implications from this are non-trivial. So for example, this will come up and sort of some of the discussions we have in the community, as you know, but you cannot just define cities any way you want or through space. You have to define them as networks of interactions between people. So you know, the places where people in the same unit work and live, right? So these are sort of the metropolitan areas of the United States, a definition that still is being defined uh, in Europe and other places. But kind of these definitions of spaces, spaces that are physical, but spaces of interaction are important. We have many dimensions of things that change and things that stay the same as you look at cities of different sizes and different contexts. And we need sort of these functional definitions of what space means. And this means many different things from neighborhoods, what are neighborhoods? It's not a skill that you can define just physically, but also what are cities? What are, are the kinds of organizations? So what I'm gonna tell you about and what uh, some of my work has been trying to explore, and I'm not saying that I have an answer or the ultimate answer, but I think I'm trying to convince you that this is possible, the kind of endeavor that I'm describing, is that we, we can look at cities and think that there's sort of a theoretical framework that has many deep roots in geography and other social sciences, as well as others, that would apply through history and extrapolate to new situations. So from the past to the present to the future, and that relies on things we can observe, both in their very human, human behavior, human choice, but also physical things that is predictive of certain statistical properties. So it's not predicting your individual behavior as people often think, it's predicting statistical things like insurance companies and casinos do, and it's falsifiable. So we can say, well, that idea didn't work, but this idea, it's still alive. So, so this is sort of the idea and that's why it's called science. But the idea is that it applies in this large context. And it's not really about technology. And it's not really about political systems. It's not really about economic systems. It's not really about energy systems or urban planning. All these things are important in context. They play a role and they set often the kind of things we can do. But it's really about deeper things, things that are common to all these environments. And so uh, these words are very loaded, but in some sense, again, the emphasis that Michael taught us to, to incorporate of, about networks or relations between people and places, ideas of cost benefit, which are quite 
quite old in economic geography. And I think some novelty about ideas of information, how people learn, but also the patterns of cities, for example, across neighborhoods, patterns of inequality. These things are very adaptable. And often spaces that are constructed have a lot of dynamics that bring these three things and more together. So the idea, these are not just tools, don't take networks as just tools or cost benefit is just something you do in an economic general equilibrium model or information is just information theory. The general generative principles to understand how space is constructed. And uh, these spaces are relational, but they're not arbitrary, they're dynamical, they're interdisciplinary uh, in ways they already talked about. They're heterogeneous, so there is inequality and difference and diversity, and they're open-ended. Okay, so today I want to tell you about this in sort of three acts. The first act is a little bit more about urban science and why do I, I'm not saying you should have to do this, but I think this is interesting. And in some sense is what I'm competent to tell you, uh, why we can think about a scientific approach to structure and dynamics of cities with all this richness that I talked about, a very important emphasis on humans and what they do. So it's about generalizable knowledge, things that we can learn in Manchester and take to Chicago and take to Lagos, Nigeria and take to Beijing. Uh, and uh, I'll give you some examples, some of them old, some of them new about what we know uh, is predicted by these contexts in the second part. Some of them are themes in the conference. So I'll just give you my very quick take on them and where they are. And third, I want to look forward and look to future cities and the challenge, particularly of sustainable development. A little bit north of you have COP26, so a lot of these things are being discussed. And uh, it's been a mixture of frustration and some hope. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about that and the role of cities and the role of the spaces we construct, perhaps the geography and these themes. I know some of you are interested in this. So first, I want to say just a few things about urban science. A lot of people uh, think that the word science is very loaded and perhaps should not be used. But I mean, just simply stuff that's generalizable and that brings together the essential elements of what we know about cities and that we can find out if these ideas are wrong or right and what. Um, they may um, imply. Okay, so I like this quote, which uh, coming from Chicago is foundational. Uh, it may not be foundational to you, but uh, for urbanists is one of the first documents that tried to systematize what cities were about. And it's this book, The City, which is sort of the product of the Chicago School of Sociology, but they really were uh, empiricists to a large extent. Uh, but Robert Park had been a journalist, a bit like Jane Jacobs, and so he had, uh, you know, he opens the book almost with this quote, which is the city is not merely a physical mechanism, not just physical geography or an artificial construction. It is involved in the vital processes of the people who compose it is a product of nature, particularly human nature. So this is basically telling you that by looking at a city, you can look at the buildings and roads, good luck, but really you're looking at a way in which people um, live collectively in a certain way uh, that may enhance their uh, hopes and desires and uh, potentials but may also of course create barriers. But in some sense, if you're messing with the city, you know, as we do with planning and policy, uh, you're also messing by corollary of this expression with human nature. So uh, we have to be careful and not just idealize what we think cities should be, which we've done all the time, both social theory and planning, but actually pay attention to what they are, what people are doing, uh, how they work and be a bit um, um, modest with the facts. So uh, in some sense, I'm not gonna give you an answer, but cities are all these things, right? A lot of people come and study cities as well as geography in terms of things like uh, justice or buildings or energy or pollution or cars or government. But the fact is that what's interesting is that all these things kind of come together, right? To create what cities are and what these built spaces are. And this is of course what Jane Jacobs called organized complexity. So it's sort of the beginning of complexity being an integral that allows you to put an emphasis on what the system of connections and organizations are, but rather than the things themselves, which as you know, and as I've been trying to express, if you look at each one of these things individually or in pairs or in small numbers, you end up with lots of contingencies. It's very hard to make anything conclusive. Um, could I ask uh, some of you guys, uh, maybe it's in the room, but I'm hearing a little bit of noise. So uh, it'd be nice if I didn't have that in my ear. Okay. So I think what's been emerging over the last maybe 20 years, I think we've always known this, but we have a means to study and test these ideas better, is that cities really are ultimately complex networks. So um, this is an idea I think, I think Michael in some sense brought into geography with uh, the New Science of Cities book, but I think this is an idea that's been growing and it's becoming more sophisticated and we know a lot more about it uh, even as we go every day. But certainly, uh, I think it's been sort of a revolution in understanding in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. So 
the point about this is that they're not just any networks and we cannot just use complex networks uh, willy-nilly to study cities. But they're special kinds of networks with particular properties, at least statistical properties. So they're networks of people as they connect to each other. So people in cities are always interdependent. That's more or less obvious, but it's important. But these networks are mediated and exist embedded in built spaces, things like you see there in the uh, I'll give you a prize if you know what that map is. I think it's a very famous map, as you know, as well. So places are connected and you can study the networks of places and buildings and so forth. And we do this, of course, and people are connected. But it's really when you go to the meta picture where these networks start fitting into each other and start constraining each other and starting creating features uh, uh, in each other's uh, sort of relational um, uh, uh, properties that you end up with something that's more special. So, okay, this is kind of strange, but I'm having the same problem again, so bear with me. Um, okay. Here we go again. I hope that just doing a reset as I did before kind of works. Okay. It does, so magic of computers. So cities are for many things that's sort of quite, quite difficult to describe, but things like growth and learning and choice, politics and being social. But again, connectivity, learning and development are good ways to try to diagnose what cities do functionally, but also the things that can go wrong. So a lot of poverty, for example, can be diagnosed in terms of different forms of disconnection as well as access to future opportunities. And see, these are some of the properties that you know Jane Jacobs could have told you about about uh, cities and built spaces, but they're important when you bring them to uh, the study of actual data and actual cities. So cities are very heterogeneous. So you have to respect the fact that they actually sustain a lot of diversity of many different kinds. Everything's interconnected and cities really exist and cooperation really exists because of complementarities. Different people have different jobs, they do different things, they live in different places. And the city really comes together out of that co collective that there are scaling relations. You know that uh, a lot of our work has been about this and I saw you had a session, but this means that even though there are things that uh, have are in a continuum, as you look at uh, cities and other spaces uh, and, and networks, these things also change properties non-linearly. So a larger city is more expensive and denser than a small place, uh, but these things exist in a certain uh, relation that's described by how the properties of these networks change with, with space. And then there's circular causality, which is very important. I always ask the question, you know, this is uh, anathema to a lot of people coming, for example, from economics. Uh, but, but part of the idea is that uh, even though somebody like Paul Krugman, who's the only Nobel Prize really about cities, uh, said it himself. But the idea is that, for example, does a city have, um, is, is a city rich because it has good infrastructure? Or does it have good infrastructure because it's rich? Right, it's both, right? You build one thing on top of the other. So these things, uh, a lot of what happens in cities are, the products of vicious cycles and virtuous cycles of development. And, uh, and this leads to a uh, process of development and evolution. So things that basically are open-ended that these built spaces enable, but they are contained really in the socioeconomic dynamics. So there's something new that emerges as these networks come together in space and in time, and then uh, can create spaces that are open-ended both as physical spaces and social spaces. So the idea is very simple and it was given to us by time geography all the way back, right, in the 60s and 70s, when people tr were trying to describe how people navigate space. And the idea, uh, it goes back to Hagerstrand and others, that th there's this idea of the life path, that we build uh, spaces through, through the spaces we inhabit. These spaces we inhabit have allowed these possibilities. But that in some sense, the interconnected connectivity that's typical of these um, com uh, complexity science approaches to cities are really the stuff we experience every day. It's all the stuff we need to do every day that you see here on the left around this, this individual. And that this is then structured in space through your life path, which implies effort and time and costs, but also expresses a structure of connectivity and interactions that allows you essentially to embed your social life into the physical space of cities. So it's in doing this calculation, I'm not gonna show you the math, that you actually can start understanding what cities are and where human geography and physical geography also come together. And in some sense, the, the touchstone, uh, uh, I think, I uh, propose, is really this idea of the life path. But, but this idea that these things are not unconstrained, but they constrain each other strongly is very important. 
right? And this gives us lots of ideas also for practice. Many of them I saw in the talks that you're discussing. A lot of them are emphasis in human geography, but also what we have come to say, to call, you know, um, person-based urban planning or person-based policy. So you can have a person, but if you can change a, a person to somebody that has different limitations or, or, or advantages or disadvantages, like somebody, for example, may be disabled, you have to consider these interactions a different way. There's a different cost benefit and so forth. A lot of this has been explored in, um, in human development in the context of capabilities approaches, which are mediated also by space, but this is kind of a picture that I'm giving you of in some sense when you think about aging cities which i think is an important theme for the conference so in the program this also means that the physical spaces of cities and the functions they mediate will have to be different so this is very important then that we have when we look at built spaces and cities in particular we have different functions at different scales and we need to be able to understand how to unpack these very complex spaces from individuals and sort of their more immediate uh, agency and cognition to neighborhoods where a lot of quality of life is expressed, uh, safety, uh, uh, political organization to some extent around human needs, I'll tell you more in a second, to the city where new things happen and where a lot of the agglomeration and scaling effects that we've been talking about happen. And then of course, there's the scale of this urban system, the system of cities that's been more studied by quantitative geography, at least uh, in the previous generation, things like Zips law and so forth, and urban systems that form essentially a global system like the world. So, um, I'll just, uh, I'll go th more quickly through this, but this is basically a quote from Jane Jacobs saying, none of this is actually difficult. It just implies a change in perspective and engaging in some sense with the reality of the ways we live in cities across many people, but also, uh, you know, things that are absolutely observable and testable. So the second part is really just giving you just like a few touchstones of my favor, and this is a very personal sort of guided tour of some of the things that cities explain. There's a lot more and you could come up maybe with better examples. But the idea is that the qualitative and the quantitative, this kind of war that we've had in geography and in other social sciences, I, I think this is a false dichotomy and that we can have very rich human concepts and subjectivity uh, together with things that are quite general and statistical and that apply to cities and larger populations all at once. And it's by going across scales that we can make sense of each in relation to the other. So these are things that are at the basis of sort of scaling. And so uh, if, if, if you know my work, I talk a lot about this, but, but they have this nice consequence that when you double the size of a city, something changes non-linearly. So for example, a famous one is economic productivity, first measured by this economist in the seventies, I think. Uh, and it's about this factor about 15, 16% per capita. This was manufacturing uh, uh, in US cities. This was crime uh, in US cities as well by another couple of economists, but these numbers come up, these numbers per capita come up to be these 10 to 20% numbers, which are kind of interesting. Where does that come from? And part of the explanation that emerged since is that these numbers are the result of the mediation of these two spaces, the social economic space into the physical space of cities that we built. I'm not gonna give you the math, but this leads to a lot of these scaling laws with exponents, so this is for wages. Again, US cities, this is the first plot I did, so I, I kind of, is dear to me, and I, I just found it the other day, so I'm showing it to you. But because these effects imply greater productivity, greater wages, greater GDP in larger cities, these effects can be enormous. As you know, the GDP of London is much larger than the GDP of uh, uh, even per capita than many other places, and the GDP of New York or Tokyo is enormous compared to even nations. And so, this applies over time. So this is kind of 50 years of data of US wages. So you see that basically once you account for the growth of the system in population and in overall economic growth, you can project the data to the same, to the same scaling relation. This is true across nations. So this is GDP. I did the same trick of uh, normalizing population. And uh, so basically I center each one of these clouds of points um, into the same frame. So that's at, at zero, zero. And then you just see the slope, you see it's very similar. China has more noise in interesting ways, it's been explored in some of the papers. And it's also true across uh, quantities of the same type. So these are all socioeconomic quantities and they all show sort of this, this, uh, this per capita um, uh, in, uh, growth with, um, with size of the city. And this is kind of very general. So as, as you know, many of you have been involved in studies like this and there are now maybe thousands of papers that do this kind of thing. But the interesting thing is that um, a lot of this uh, has been tested in many different urban systems. The definition of the city matters. It has to be a network compatible definition. 
Otherwise you will get inconclusive results. Uh, it's been also applied through history in settlements that are easier to measure because they're smaller. So there's a list there from 19th century England uh, where you know, Manchester was one of the stars to Roman Empire, to Inca and the Aztecs, where you can compare uh, uh, societies that invented cities necessarily independently. But it does break down like any good theory should in places like hunter-gatherer camps and slums. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. The logic of this in the end is that there's basically a densification effect in the built environment, which is shown here on the left using roads. So this means there's less road per capita and there's this uh, increase in socioeconomic outputs on the right. Uh, and these two effects are mirror effects. So there's sort of a general effect in which the densification and intensification of these socioeconomic networks produces the outcome. And you see this in Europe, you see this in China. So uh, it's, it's fairly robust, even though obviously also has different characteristics. And it works more or less like this. Here's the sort of socioeconomic network fuzzed out and there's the uh, uh, infrastructure network as the trains and you put this network of people, it's more or less what I showed you through the line. So this is sort of your life path. Yeah, everyone has that life path, but basically you need conserve effort and you get all these things sort of in a small city. And once you go to a larger city, your house gets a little smaller because space is more expensive. You get more interactions with the same effort and this basically gives you the acceleration. The other thing that's important, and this is kind of the more technical and busy of my slides, I apologize, is that infrastructure in cities is not flat. It actually is somewhat hierarchical, but decentralized. And this emerged really through people that are studying transportation and flows of people and so forth. So for example, in the system of highways, it's easy to see. You can have a motorway, as you call them in Britain, that kind of has uh, wider roads, but faster flows, and you have intermediate roads and you have local roads. And these have a structure of compensating flows and currents that actually allows the city to be quite efficient in moving things around, but has very predictable consequences. For example, the traffic jams tend to be almost always in the highways because they're very sensitive to if the traffic slows down, but the volume is maintained, you will immediately get a traffic jam. But this implies that sort of the costs of moving everything in around the city, not just people, and the benefits of these uh, accelerated and intensified socioeconomic networks are commensurate. And so you can create cities that are larger where you pay a lot higher um, uh, costs of movement, but you also have higher socioeconomic benefits. And so you can have a scale invariance of cities that you've seen things like Zip's law. Okay, so you can explain this through a series of arguments. And this is in the book, it's a somewhat long uh, set of arguments. And uh, you, know, uh, you, you can read them if you want to spend time with the slide, but it requires all these things, understanding these various networks, understanding some ideas of uh, their uh, non-integer dimensions, another concept that Michael introduced, I think, to a large extent to, ge uh, to geography, but that's used here in a somewhat different way, in networks and uh, mobility. And then the understanding uh, sort of the spaces of cities with, in terms of these decentralized hierarchical networks and then putting it all together. Okay, but this works also uh, in the past. So this is the Aztecs. They actually invented, and the people of the new world invented cities independently. They were different to the eye, but they have some of the same characteristics. So in sort of, um, as I kind of go towards the last third of my talk, uh, all these perspectives of thinking about relations, interactions, choice, and bringing these two models that we've had for a while, for example, models of demography, allow us to start making sense of a lot of things that we've had also in quantitative geography. Like for example, uh, laws like Zipf's law as a neutral law of choice across cities. And this then predicts certain characteristics, characteristics of Zipf's law as sort of a maximum entropy law of a sort when the choices are essentially canceled, but also allows you to read deviations from Zipf's law as positive choices that people are making in preferring cities of specific sizes or in different locations, which is a characteristic of cities. And this has a lot more, this part now, which I'm not gonna focus on, but I'm happy to discuss, has to do a lot with the nature of economic growth uh, that's embedded into choice and learning in cities. So this is an example that's famous to economists that urbanization here on the x-axis promotes economic growth um, across nations. It's a very noisy relationship as you can see, but it's actually quite robust as well. So the last part of this sequence is to do with neighborhoods. So a completely different scale going to sort of a small scale. And this is a, an important scale because the scale at which People organize often socially and politically uh, around needs. It's a space of quality of life to a large extent. It's very important for kids and for elderly. Uh, and it's also a space uh, in which inequality is expressed. So this is a map of my city where I live in Chicago. I live in the place there, Hyde Park, which is somewhat rich because of the university. 
but it's surrounded by relatively poor neighborhoods if you've been to Chicago. But the inequality is something that we're, uh, many fields are interested in and that can be studied with much better data. But as you know, it's a quantity, it's very hard to uh, uh, conceptualize and then solve in society. So it's something that I think is very interest, interesting in geography. And as you can see, Chicago is basically a lake bed. There's no, not a lot of physical geography, but has a lot of human geography. This is just wealth and poverty. And it's also a local flavor here. So I was just teaching this to my students the last lecture. And so it's something that really came to the fore with the idea of uh, racial segregation and economic disadvantage in cities. So there's very important work in sociology by Bill Wilson here in the 80s. And then uh, sort of a parallel work, more or less almost at the same time, just a little bit before, in terms of community organization that happened just here. I can uh, see where Sololinsky used to work, which is this idea that people must intervene in space and they need to organize and to try to change the system. Sololinsky's techniques were actually very somewhat confrontational and uh, subversive, which is interesting and good and humorous. But in some sense, this has now traveled the world, now coming to the 21st century. And it's sort of the way in which many communities are working throughout the world, particularly in, uh, in South Asia and Africa. So this is a very famous report by, by, um, uh, by a nonprofit in Mumbai about how slums could organize themselves and demand services. And this has now come to work that I've been involved with by Slum Dwellers International in terms of communities that map themselves in some sense to create their own urban planning and uh, um, uh, demanding you know, to be seen, to be formalized, but also to get urban services. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, it's a rich theme, but I wanted to illustrate this as sort of a person-driven, community-driven approach to creating spaces that are different and changing spaces. And in some sense, invoking the right to the city. That's in some sense, using scientific methodologies, but from a point of view also of um, social advocacy. So in some sense, you know, if you're a geographer, this is the part that really warms your, hair, your heart. It doesn't matter where you go and you show people a map and this kind of thing happens, right? People can just start discussing their issues, their collective challenges in a different way. And so a lot of this work is really uh, enabled by GIS technology and maps that allow people to look at these spaces which are quite unstructured. Most of these are informal neighborhoods and imagine what needs to be done, for example, so that people get services. And this has now become, this is the part of the work that I was more involved in, uh, uh, is that the sort of, these worlds are coming together, the world of quantitative geography and GIS and the world of course, of community organization and advocacy and livelihoods in terms of creating data sets that actually bring the perspective of, of communities and, and people in very extreme situations to, uh, to the language of planners and geographers at different scales. So these are just examples I'm showing you of community maps that were developed, uh, some of them funded, as you can see, by uh, UKID. Um, and that allows us to start exploring the kind of spatial inequalities that we see and how these have been structured over time. So this is Brazil. So this is kind of bringing together now census data, community data, all kinds of things towards a much richer picture of how cities are developing, but also of many of the problems of injustice that they express. We have a very uh, exciting new data of all the urban footprints of Sub-Saharan Africa created by, yes, AI techniques and, uh, and uh, uh, high precision remote sensing. And so you can see this, that you can basically start looking at cities in terms of neighborhoods. So you divide the world into neighborhoods one by one. A lot of the neighborhoods of Sierra Leone that we're studying here in the slide uh, look a bit like this. So this, to many of you who've worked in many of these contexts, is, is a neighborhood in between. It's not, is a bit formal that has some streets and some infrastructure that is also, as you can see, a bit informal. So this is the reality of most cities in the 21st century, the ones that in some sense um, need, uh, um, you know, need to develop uh, decent livelihoods for their people, but also needs to create models of development that's sustainable. So we're trying to use sort of this, this mixture of methods from the human perspective to, you know, the latest data to really build models of incremental development and planning that are both sustainable, respond to communities, but also facilitate in general the work. So these are slides about very dense neighborhoods that are informal and in some sense, the fraction of population that are in uh, neighborhoods that are very hard to service in yellow and the fraction of property, uh, people that are in neighborhoods that need a little bit of additional services, but in some sense are easy to upgrade. So this starts creating a very rich typology that's not a slum, no slum, but really has to do with a deeper understanding, including a human understanding on the ground, but also understanding based on data.
of what are these massive problems of development allows us to look at them sort of at smaller scales where the human experience is structured and then allows us to start thinking about possible solutions that need to be developed in context. Okay, so this is what we call the Millie Neighborhoods Project. And I'm not gonna say more about that, but basically it's looking at the world one neighborhood at a time. And when you look at neighborhoods that have deficits of infrastructure, about a million of them. Okay, and my last part, just in a few minutes, is how do we use these ideas and the convergence in some sense of human and physical geography, uh, taking seriously what these built spaces really are and how they mediate uh, capabilities for people and communities, but also how do we take this forward to new situations? So when we think about sustainable development, we're thinking about problems of equity, problems of continued prosperity, but also, of course, problems of how we relate to the environment. And these are things that even though we all think are matters of effort, uh, we don't know how to solve because they involve so many different situations that in the past, like equity and prosperity or prosperity in the environment that we think have been in opposition so in some sense, cities provide us with some examples where these, these functions can come and be synergistic, right? They increase people's prosperity, perhaps, by having a better relationship with the environment. But these have to be unpacked over scales and tried out in situations that are different, like uh, the picture Sierra Leone I was showing you. So this is also known to be a property of cities, just like they produce greater economic productivity per capita. They also produce more trash and more emissions per capita using fossil fuel technologies and so forth. And so this is kind of a place where interestingly enough, the spaces that we built and the ways we live in cities is also driving public opinion and a, and a certain agenda to create solutions. So uh, part of the way I see it, or uh, putting this problem in a nutshell is that cities can do this sort of thing in 25 years, this Shanghai can go from, you know, a very different city to a very modern city. But the question is, how do you, do you harness this? We have about 25 years, right, to address the problem of sustainability, maybe less. And so how do we harness this capability for fast transformations to create sustainable development, right? This is not sustainable. So this is an article I like by Kim uh, Stanley Robinson. He has a fantastic new book called The Ministry of the Future about uh, you know, the near future of climate change and how it may, it may not be solved and addressed. And so I'm reading through it. And I think it's very rich in perspectives, often much better than the kind of stuff we do, let's say I do in um, academic research. But part of the idea is that we're gonna be changing the, not only the cities, but also the urban systems that we're gonna have, right? When we talk about, so here on the left is sort of the way we've been having cities and, and systems of cities where cities often import a lot of materials and energy and then export pollution and trash and other things. To the right, where we are talking often in terms of a lot more uh, circular flows in cities so that we actually produce more of the energy and consume it locally. Um, and where we may leave a lot more nature by itself, 30 by 30 or 50 by 50, or ideas of rewilding. I'm sure many of these ideas actually came from the UK. They're very powerful there, but we don't know how to build urban systems that work like this. And in some sense, this would be really unbalancing a lot of the urban systems we have in, in the sense that small towns that have been producing food and energy for large cities, uh, their purpose would be you know, certainly diminished. So it's a question of what will happen and that we have a deeper understanding of urban systems, cities and neighborhoods such that we deliver sort of solutions that are uh, good for people and good for the environment. So this is already happening. A lot of cities are leading the way. These are American examples by, by and large. So this is an example from New York City that's aligning a lot of its sustainable development plan with uh, sustainable development goals internationally. And so this is sort of a structure of measurement, a structure of objectives at 2030 or 2040. But as you can see, it's also a system to integrate a lot of interdisciplinary knowledge at different scales. So things that you, you know, we care in human and physical geography from transportation to culture, if you read that at the top, to parks and to neighborhoods are all part of the same plan to uh, attain you know, more sustainable cities and communities. Or this is LA, uh, Los Angeles in the context of the United States was a city that actually put equity in the front, uh, in the front page of sustainability plans. New York didn't do that early. It was more of a climate plan. But again, there are a lot of measurements. They're complex, they're dealing to the same sort of uh, objectives and that these are driving collaborations within the city and with communities and sort of uh, a way to try to achieve some of these objectives, some of them more quantitative, some less, but nevertheless, this is sort of a structure of measurement that's embedded in GIS and, and spatialized uh, 
uh, systems and so forth that's kind of enabled by geography and its tradition of doing many things, but that's now become in some sense the, the, the mechanism for achieving sustainable development and localizing it. And this is Barcelona. It's kind of interesting because you can see they're missing their targets to a large extent, but if they were not uh, following some of these targets, they probably would not know. So this is my last slide, and uh, I propose them as some of the, both my conclusions from what I wanted to tell you today, but also some themes that I would like to stay with you. That in some sense, if you look at cities as built environments, both human and physical, you require knowledge of the processes in integrated, coupled, social and physical spaces. It's only when you couple them that you start making sense of them. If you just study the social or the economic or the physical in separation, you will not understand cities, you'll find a lot of contingencies. Uh, so this relies on connectivity, information, cost and benefits for different kinds of people, different situations. And often these ideas of circular causality, what happens reinforces positively or negatively certain things. We're benefiting in all this work from a lot of things that are new, like information technologies, data, complexity science tools, such as networks. But there's really a these are no substitute for a deeper understanding of what these spaces are and how they work. So you need sort of general principles that you keep testing and refining. And that's sort of the logic of how we can work today. And this then allows you to have a much better, you know, handle on what you see today and hopefully some of the things that we need to do in the future without killing the patient by creating some transformations that we wish for, but that may or may not be delivered in ways that uh, reach the objectives. And the scientific respect doesn't tell you what to do but allows you to create better kinds of solutions. Uh, finally, I think we have sort of ways to bring in a lot of the tools of geography from GIS to data to the physical and human dimensions coupled together of spaces in order to create sort of a sustainable future. But this is still to play out and needs to be invented sort of as a practice as well as a set of, um, um, as a body of knowledge. So in, in doing that, I think the time is short and it requires a lot of collaboration and new perspectives. And I think that that's really the challenge for all of us in geography and adjacent disciplines is to find a way to take the knowledge that we have and tools that we have into this future that's unknown, but that in some sense is somewhat clear and at some level, but needs to be localized and be individualized and be fair. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Thank you very much. It was a great talk. Uh, nicely bringing together, well, all the knowledge, methods, data, and, and, and tools to, to address things that, as I think you mentioned clearly, is as old as our approach to understanding cities, but are in a totally different moment of how to do it. Uh, I'll open the floor to this to, to questions or comments uh, uh we want to in the chat um i don't know if uh, you can unmute yourself you can write on the chat uh, or you can raise your hand yeah you can raise your electronic hand i mean and your physical hand too This light. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'll go with one. It's interesting to see. It's interesting to see which your oh, someone has a. Is it a hand? No, it's just a clapping. Yeah, yeah. I raised my hand. Oh yeah, which is a clapping. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Hello, uh, Professor Betancourt. This is a. Uh, uh, audience from Shenzhen, China. Uh, I love your presentation very much, although I'm not very insightful in terms of urban science. Uh, I have a question from technical side. Uh, the most inspiring pages from your uh, presentation, from my perspective, is that you have shown there is a scaling law for cities across a different kind of aspects, like the uh, like the population and the average income or, or what up or others. My question is that I noticed some of the graph are measured in log log graph and are resulting in a very high correlation coefficient. I'm curious if we do not measure in log log graph, like just marrying plain numbers, uh, will we still got this, those high numbers, uh, will or will not, and uh, any indications with, uh, for for this situation. 
Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, I mean, that, that's an issue of estimation. And so uh, you can do a straight up power law fit without transforming the variables. Um, you know, the R square has, has a similar meaning, but in some sense makes more sense when you're looking for uh, a linear relationship. So that's, it's a better metric if you're looking for a linear relationship, which you get uh, for reasons that you see in the data, but they're also somewhat fundamental to do with the log. Uh, the reason to use the log and to do it this way is not just, I mean, you, you can mess with the data and do what you, what you think you should do, but, but when you see the log, let's say of wages or GDP, what does that mean? What is that quantity? Does it have a meaning or is it just a nice way of transforming the data? And this was shown in a slide that I kind of uh, glossed over that had to do with sort of this relationship between GDP per capita and urbanization at the national level. Uh, so the log of a quantity is basically the integral of its growth rate. And what's interesting, whenever you see scale uh, invariant relationships in socioeconomic systems, it's because uh, these relationships are preserved under exponential growth. So the, the logarithm has a very specific meaning that uh, has a physical quantity, uh, you know, uh, relates to sort of a temporal average of a physical quantity. So it's nice to express it that way. And as you can see, it produces very, um, by and large, not always, uh, very clean relationships. So that's why it's done that way. And um, you can do it in a different way, and then you need to find an appropriate goodness of fit. And uh, if you don't log it, it will look messier for sure. But okay, the point right. is that the growth rate is an important quantity. And that's ultimately, I didn't get into this because it's a bit more technical, but it is important. that If you think about uh, uh, the processes involved in, um, in socioeconomic dynamics, but also socioeconomic dynamics of cities, is that they're almost all stochastic geometric, so a multiplicative uh, exponential processes. Everything grows by two or 3%, right? It's, it's, percent, it's a percent world, a log world. And so in that logic, then these logs have a specific meaning and that's why we plot them this way. They're also more or less how uh, in, in other contexts, one does scaling laws. So scaling laws are just basically a very simple, very general uh, method of analyzing uh, any system that has two variables of interest. Usually one is the scale. So in this case, I was using population. It could have used spatial extent, other things, but it's extensive is something that tells you how big the system is. And then you see how some of the properties uh, uh, depend on that. So you do something similar for an ecosystem or, uh, or gas or star. These are all systems that have statistical properties as functions of their size. So this is a tool. But typically, uh, if you expect scale invariance, then you take logs because logs are scale invariant functions. So that's why you do it as well. But it's related to these processes that are multiplicative. Um, we, we have so I hope that helps. But it, you know, statistics are statistics. You have to choose the right method for the right process. Good. Let's go to Mike first, and then address okay. the chat. And uh, yeah, Denise had a question, I think. And yeah, now there are a bunch of questions also. Let's go to my question and you'll do okay. it. Okay. I'll let Nuno, would you, would you coordinate the question? I'll coordinate okay. this, yeah, no worries. Uh, Mike, Mike, see you. Hello, Mike. Nuno, no, 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 you, you'd like me to talk for a minute? Yeah, yeah, you have your yeah, yeah sorry, sorry, yeah. I, I very much empathize um, <clears throat> with uh, much of what you said, uh, Lewis, of course. And I very much believe that <clears throat> the challenge is to extend our science, if you like, into the future and the past and so on, and to actually make connections in this sense. But since the pandemic began, we've been involved, and I'm sure you have, um, everybody's in, been involved with lots and lots of different sorts of disciplines. Uh, certainly here in UCL, we have been, particularly the health sciences, and which is heavily variegated into different ways. Uh, and all of them are interested in cities in some sense. So, you know, the last, 10, 15 years, and certainly in the, during the pandemic, an enormous number of people have become interested in cities because ultimately the end of the day, you know, people are infected in cities, in buildings and so on. Um, and to some extent, um, the, the general perspective, I think, of many of these groups of people, academics um, and practitioners too, uh, is that cities is just a way of, uh, of looking at the specialisms in that sense. So, so in a way, um, 
they do not get the point very much that we need to connect things together. I continue to make the point that uh, really we need to provide the glue to stitch all of this stuff together in some sense to build a true, a, a true science. So, so this was my reaction to what you were saying, very much in <laughs> agreement, but also enormous obstacles uh, in, in, in the way of doing this. I'm, I'm reminded that um, uh, in Bartlett planning, I've always tried to push this sort of stuff we've been doing into planning, of course, because that's our focus. Uh, but there are many people um, in the Bartlett here who say, well, if you want to do this sort of quantitative stuff, you just go down and see people in CASA, right? And that is exactly the <laughs> wrong way of thinking about it all. I mean, um, we really need to make the connections and it is incredibly difficult. I mean, I was quite intrigued by the fact that you seem to be making them or rebuilding them um, after Park Jess in Chicago, really, at this point. Oh, so thank you, Mike. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. Uh, I, I'll take it a bit more as a comment, but let me comment back. I, I agree with everything you said, basically. Uh, but I, I think that um, <laughs> I, I'm more hopeful for sort of our students and people that are coming into the field, sometimes with sort of uh, questions from the side, like like uh, in public health and, and contagious diseases and so forth. You know, one of the things that we did uh, immediately is that the kind of thing that we're doing here actually gives you a prediction for the rates of infection that you should see in the COVID pandemic. And lo and behold, you know, so, so the, dense, the networks are denser, right, by, by, uh, by uh, prediction and, and assumptions to some extent. So you should see at least in the first wave before people uh, adapt it, that there should be higher rates in larger cities. And this is true for the United States. And it was true also for a few other countries. I think it was also, somebody showed me some data from the UK. I didn't look at it myself, but I think there had somewhat similar characteristics. So this also predicts, by the way, how much the fact that people in larger cities need to be more vaccinated, vaccination rates need to be higher because, because again, the networks would be denser. So you need to knock out more of those links. So it has predictions that are actually quite specific <laughs> that are useful for somebody doing public health, not just for somebody studying cities. So that's just an example. Uh, we also had studies in, in, in Mumbai and other cities they were a little bit different what to do with uh, neighborhood structure, informality, and, and uh, sort of the structure of networks within sort of neighborhoods and across neighborhoods. They are of a different kind, but also related to some of these ideas that we discussed today. So, I, so that's one kind of answer is that, in fact, you have to take people with this sort of question at face value, but then show them how and, how, and if it's a question for us, uh, the kind of more integrated knowledge that we've been talking about uh, uh, is useful uh, or what else does it say that is not contained already in, in a narrow perspective so i think that that's essential that we're able to articulate answers like that i'm trying to work a little bit with somebody you know which is nicholas de Monchot on uh who's now the chair of architecture in uh at, uh, at mit and he was at berkeley before uh, and he he's he's closer to planning and you know he's his perspective also from mit is that you know, we need to, in some sense, uh, create new tools. So you did a bit with, uh, you know, fractal dimensions and all that analysis of cities. That was very important. But, you know, there are tools that, for example, the kind of things I was talking about today, you know, how do you actually think about everyone wants to do person-centric design, person-centric planning and policy, right? Particularly for questions of equity. Well, you know, uh, so we're playing with the idea as well. You could think about a bit of time geography, but now actually with rich data, and with, with objectives that are of our time and you know, with the cost benefits that different people kind of experience. And that's a very nice tool to think about how to do it. That's not just about talking about it and listening to people's opinions, but actually starts um, giving us an analysis tool, maybe a quantification and data gathering tool for doing something that people are talking about. And that often is quite vague, but you know, starts integrating this network structure around individuals or communities. So that's a different way, presumably, this is just an example, and it's a bit half-baked, but it's just an example of how you'd bring these perspectives as useful, but also how you embed them as tools so that uh, people that are closer to practice can actually use them and see their value. But I think we should think more about that. And I think there's a lot of these opportunities to think about. And you know, often part of the problem is that you know, we, it, it's hard in the social sciences and particularly in social uh, applied sciences and practice that people often already think 
that they know the answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. And often they don't because we keep repeating the same mistakes and getting the same results, right, in practice. And so I think it's people like us that have convinced them like, no, you haven't thought about it right, try this and you'll see that you'll see the world differently and you know, forms of action become possible. So I think that that's happening, but I think we need to be clear about some of these tools and ways of seeing and ways of working that come from emphasizing networks, emphasizing diversity, emphasizing issues of learning and information. Thanks. Uh, we have uh, a question by Denise about going back to the scaling laws and four-step theory. We also have a, a question from Celine about the a bit the discussion we're having now. We want to go first for Celine's question and back to Denise. In the sense that this fall, I think, is a good follow-up of what you you've been characterizing as a secret science or secret. You can see that you can see the question in the chat. Yes. So I have. Uh... Should I start with Celine? That's what you told yeah, me to do. I, I apologize, Denise. So let's see. Uh, I'm going to read it because maybe not everyone has read it. So Celine Rosenblatt writes, in my, point, uh, in my point of view, in science in general, the most difficult thing is to shift from a level to another one, and specifically from micro to meso and macro. How do you build the collective entity or communities or entire cities regarding individual citizens? For example, for the new issues of global change, how do we define collective individual parts of the change and combinations? So I, I agree with you, Celine. That's an excellent question. So how do we go across scales, right? And uh, I think this has been a lot of the challenge of, you could say of geography, but also I think more broadly of even, um, of even social theories that, you know, we have theories and approaches like economics who at least in the last 50 years or so, is really emphasized, maybe maybe earlier than that, but emphasize individual, individual choice, individual optimization. And you have other disciplines, maybe just to pick one, sociology, which emphasizes sort of collective mechanisms, ecological, human ecological effects, where a lot of the neighborhood uh, literature is showing us that the way people grow up in a community, in a physical space also, that's constructed around that community matters a lot for the individual. So I think it's not it's not easy. And then, of course, there are issues of global change as we lead, deal with sustainability. So that's another set of important things, right? We, we are dealing, as we talk about COP26, we're talking about carbon in the atmosphere, for example, and deforestation. But of course, we're also talking about the well-being of communities and equity. So that's super different scales. And I think there's some uh, well-intentioned, but somewhat wishful thinking that we could just solve local problems and solve the, at the same time, the, the, the global problems or vice versa. We need to create the articulations. And I think these articulations, which are kind of network connections, but also bring out this, this concept in complex systems of emergence that through the interactions, new things appear, which of course is at the, uh, at the origins of scaling and other things is, is important. I think people like us need to articulate those connections, but I think if you could sit down a policymaker or even a, um, somebody who's interested in these issues, they see the connections. They know that there have different consequences across scales, but we don't have a lot of the tools to manifest those, uh, you know, certainly in terms of theory, right? An economist would still write that the utilities add up it's rare that they would say that the utilities don't add up and they have sort of nonlinear effects in terms of a larger and larger population, which is necessary to explain cities. So I think that work still needs to be done to some extent, even though it should be obvious in the phenomenon that these things matter, but then I think it can become work that's not definitive telling you what it should be, but in fact is work that explores these connections. And when you make action at one scale, for example, of communities, you also are asking that their aggregate dynamics, whether it's economic or in terms of carbon, also has a collective signal that then feeds back, like all these indicators that LA and, and Los Angeles and all other cities are creating, I'm sure British cities, also feed back on the action of communities. So we have sort of the signals that we're creating to do this, but I think we need to think about their architecture and then its dynamics. And I think as scientists and, and scholars, we have to come in and express their importance and manifest them either through data or through concepts, how they might work. Uh, but I think that that's part of what's new in geography and, and maybe in, in studies of cities at this point is that we can kind of see these connections better and see their consequences back and forth. 
uh, and therefore I think it's primed for for a lot of progress, both scientific and, and practical. But I, you know, and I think again we have the tools to do it, and cities are doing this, and nations are doing this, and it's kind of the zeitgeist. But there's a lot of work to be done. Um, so that doesn't help, but I think uh, maybe helps a little bit. I hope. But it, you know, it's not it's not an ultimate answer. It's more of a procedural answer that there's a lot of opportunity in this space, and there's a lot of need. Denise had a yeah. yeah. Should I go to Denise's Let's question? Denise. Yes. Yes, Hi, Denise. You. So good, so good to hear you and have your question. <laughs> thank you, Louis. So, oh, no, Denise has been you. a pioneer in all this field, particularly of. Uh, do you want to ask it? Oh, ask the yeah. question. Okay. Uh, sure. your, your presentation was a very, uh, uh, very interesting, uh, and my question is about only one slide, the one you presented <laughs> uh, as a. a four-step theory of scaling, mm -hmm. are those uh, steps uh, uh, linked to peculiar uh, historical periods? And uh, perhaps I, I didn't see well, but uh, you, you were speaking about a special equi equilibrium at the end, a kind of convergence. I would like to, <laughs> to know better your ideas uh, yeah. about that. I, I, I will try maybe to just bring up the slide. Maybe, I don't know if that will just confuse us all, but uh, I'll just bring it up. It's explained better in, in some written material, but let me just try that. Um, so Thank you. Hopefully you see it here. So this is about the, the scaling relations, right? And so this is work uh, that I did a while ago and this continues to evolve a little bit, but this is essentially uh, what you need to explain the way I did so far. Uh, some of the numbers, so not just that you have scaling, but some of the numbers like these exponents about one six, and then how they may change as we elaborate the theory and have more considerations. But the first idea, just I think to try to answer the question the way you asked it, is that this first question of the amorphous settlement model, this is a version of models that we had from Fontunen and from Alonso about a city that basically has transportation costs. It does not need to be uh, monocentric or radial. That's an assumption that they made, which is unnecessary. But there's a cost of movement, which you can drive quite simply. And there's a certain population density. And you, just, you can just evacuate uh, you know, the, the number of connections that somebody moving a certain distance is likely to have in a statistical sense as a benefit to the cost of movement, which is proportional to the length of travel, at least in the simple version. And this gives you already these, it gives you uh, two scaling relations, one that relates uh, area to population, another one that relates the number of socioeconomic connections and therefore their products to also the population. And the, the first one is sublinear and the second is superlinear. It's very simple uh, and, and you get it right away in a few lines. And, we call this the amorphous settlements in my science paper. We also use this in archaeology because it turns out that when Scott Ortman uh, started uh, asking me questions about these ideas into archaeology, he had a lot of very small settlements, settlements that are hard for us. You've done a lot of work like this that goes down to very uh, detailed data, but, but often in modern systems, very hard for us to see and have data on small, small towns of just a few hundred people or tens of people. And he has a lot of these in archaeology, and a lot of these settlements are amorphous in the sense they have a smattering of houses, but they don't have streets and more infrastructure. So this gives you sort of a first idea of why things are superlinear and sublinear in a certain way. And then you have to work, work a lot harder <laughs> to get to the actual numbers. So the second step has to do with conserving efforts so that people don't, you know, that the scaling effect is not a matter of people putting in more effort, but, uh, but actually has to do with the densification of space and the intensification of socioeconomic interactions. The third step, I just flashed the slide, has to do with this nature of built spaces in cities. The fact that they have this um, hierarchical in a certain sense, but distributed uh, nature. Uh, and, and that's important to actually get the costs of movement right. They're not just proportional to length, but this infrastructure mediates some savings in terms of transportation. And then you can put it all together. And the simplest thing to do to just make contact with these models, of uh, older models of geography and economics is that you can build a spatial equilibrium if you want. But these basically just evacuate the benefits of interaction to the costs of movement. But you can also leave that not as a strict equilibrium, but an equilibrium that allows you to then have a small fraction of resources that are reinvested and then create exponential growth on a longer time scale. 
And if that growth now, so this is not in this slide, but if that growth is uh, scale dependent, so that depends on the size of cities, which can happen, it's not always true, but it can happen. You know, G. Brazilaw says it, it shouldn't be that, but sometimes it is a little bit. That growth will actually feed back onto the scaling law and destroy strict scale invariance. You start having exponents that can vary a little bit with scale, and then you have a more statistical theory that has all the stuff in that allows you to actually correct exponents and not just get those simple numbers, but get something that may even have scale dependence and may have numerical correction. So that's the way you build up a theory that <laughs> has constraints, has structure, but then eventually has uh, statistics that allows you to see where the simple things come from and how they're corrected by more realistic behavior. So it was hard for me to explain all that in a few slides, so I didn't, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you for trying. <laughs> yes. It's a great question. Good. Uh, we have still time for a couple of some questions more. We go at, at least at half past. Is there any other question? I have one, uh, but I'll give the space first to the audience. Uh, well, while the audience gets mobilized, so uh, we should be to put in context, when I was appointed to my lectureship here, which is a traditional talent, trend, talent planning department, uh, I had to do this presentation of a, a course unit that I would develop. And I, I, I proposed one that is working now called Decision Support Systems and Planning. And has a little maths and a little kind of concepts from maths and physics and optimization applied to problems in space. First question from the audience, which are my current colleagues now at the time trying to see if I was appointable or not, was what the, what, what the hell do our students need this, right? <laughs> um, and uh, and so I, I, I had to explain, I had to have the knowledge to be able to critically choose an approach that will use some types of decision support, not just mapping or JS or stuff like that. So, uh, Yes, this relates to what you present today. So lots of knowledge that is being passed on to through tools and tools that are readable to the public, whatever this public might be, informed, less informed, voters, paid taxpayers, whoever. And my question is, we have this dichotomy, right? We work a lot on models and sophisticated stuff and we present this, and they are quite robust and valid, and yet they are not fully applicable. They don't have the adherence we want from the practice. Mike is involved in the digital, so this assessment by RTPI of digital planning, which is, you would expect that we have been talking about this in the 90s. But now we're getting there, right? So the pandemic opened, my question to you is, the pandemic opened a door because for 18 months, we were bombarded on a daily basis with models, right, the curve, indicators like the RT, which difficult to understand many people, but people talked about this in the coffee break and they, they made decisions, should I go on vacations? They talked about growth rates, right? Of uh, moving averages of seven and 14 days. So yep. the average person was really getting into stuff that we, is simple stuff, but very powerful stuff that we use on our, so do you think there's an opportunity here to go and show you, for example, your scaling loss which are also simple to understand. They're not very complex in, the, in many aspects, if you explain it in a, in, a, in a simple way. Is this a new opportunity for us? Should we seize the moment and start? What should we do? <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what to do, right? <laughs> but but I, think, I, think, I think the answer is yes, it is an opportunity. Uh, you know, I think taking the argument you just mentioned, but also picking up on, on Michael's comment before, but I think the way you put it, Nuno, you know, is good uh, with RT, which is a somewhat you know, abstract concept that turned out to be actually the critical concept, right? It's just the chain reaction number. I was in the early days of, of this kind of thing for fluids, sort of interesting. Um, I had an episode where I had written a paper a while back about real-time estimation of the thing and the guys from um, Instagram picked it up and created this whole thing online. <laughs> and it was like weird. But you know, but people people are just using it, right? Technologists are using it. The public is using these concepts in some ways, and I think that is a sign. You know, and in many ways, the tools of geography are embedded in everything we do. Like GIS, we don't talk about GIS anymore, right? But it's in your phone, right? You use it every day to just get between places or, or order dinner or whatever. So, and what I see, for example, in the work we've done that I alluded to quickly, uh, in terms of you know development in in. Uh, in developing cities, seeking formalization is that communities can pick up these tools quickly. Maps are very intuitive. 
they are also tools for coordination of collective action that people see them. I, I say, I, I use this expression a lot of putting people on the same map so that they can see sort of the constraints and possibilities of the spaces that they share. So I think these tools are, are being used by many different agents at many different ways. I, th I think we're at the time uh, that obviously has been obviously criticized uh, for a long time, but that's sort of the, the, the godlike bird's eye view of the planner, right? We, we kind of don't do that anymore, don't do that so much. It doesn't mean that we also don't do that, but we also have to have the perspective of the person on the ground, of diverse people and how the city unfolds for them. But I think these can be brought together and explained in relation to each other. And, uh, and I think there's openness to do that. I also see that my students, I, another thing I like to say is that data is not what it used to be, right? It's an obvious thing to say, but you know, data used to be stuff in files and you know, spreadsheets and stuff like that with a bunch of numbers. And it was like, what does that mean? But data now you know, is in your phone. It's stuff that we do every day that we live by. You know, that's, that gives us the weather prediction and the COVID prediction. So I think people that are being educated now, there's an opportunity. My students are not qualitative or quantitative. They kind of mix things up. And if the data and the methods can be delivered in this more experiential way, that is embedded in, in our experience in cities, our hopes for development and so forth, it's much easier to, and much more natural and probably much truer that, uh, that some of our tools and our knowledge can find, can be transformational. But I think we, we need to often look for those handshakes where, where one thing becomes another. You know, GIS in some sense, <laughs> amazing, right? I mean, it used to be a technical thing and it completely won, it took over the world. It's like a tool that's in everyone's pocket. But, you know, let's take credit for it, but also imagine, you know, more things like that. Thanks. It doesn't have... mean it's always used for good, of course. Sure. <laughs> um, any more questions? I know it's a bit late already for many of us, but, uh, or comments? If not, uh, it uh, is now on my end to thank Luis for this great talk. I think it's a great opening keynote lecture because it will make us look at the, the detailed presentations of tomorrow and Friday in a different, well, with the framework of analyzing how those tools, approaches, and, and breadth and depth of, of those approaches can really inform and, and bring more, I don't want to say just useful, but uh, well, robust kind of knowledge that allow us to, 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 to interact better with our counterparts in planning, decision-making, policy, and everything like that. Luis, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, everybody. So good to see you. Good to yeah. see you all friends and uh, new ones. Yeah. And have a great conference. I'll try to drop in. OK, thank you very much. Uh, and to the audience, we resume tomorrow, 9 a.m. GMT. Uh, all times are GMT, so don't, don't, don't